All righty, let me add just a couple of things to what Brother Terry said about uh, starting back on uh, next Sunday. We are excited about that. We will go back to two services, 8.30 and 11 o'clock, uh, and everything will be clean and just exactly uh, what they ought to be. But I want to add uh, something about the following Wednesday. We will begin our Wednesday night prayer meeting once again. Uh, we will have not only a meeting in here when we go through our discipleship. Uh, of course, the single ladies will be meeting again. But uh, also uh, our WANA program for our children upstairs. So I hope that you'll, uh, if you have children of a WANA age, if they're not registered, uh, that you'll get them registered and be a part of our WANA program. And uh, we're going to do everything we possibly can to get everything started back right. And then I want to add also that on the uh, first Sunday after Labor Day, which is September the 13th, we uh, are planning on starting back with Sunday school. We are planning on starting back with a Sunday night service and uh, trying to get back as close to normal as we possibly can. So that is on September the 13th, we will have Sunday school. We'll let you know uh, by phone or by letter, whatever, exactly how that's going to work. I promise you things will be safe. Things will be clean. Uh, you won't have to worry about it in that respect. Now, also, I want to encourage you again, as Brother Terry said, we just want to try to reiterate this. Uh, we want you to feel comfortable. We don't want you to do anything that you don't feel like that you should do. We want you to be sure that uh, I don't want you to come if you don't feel like that you should, uh, uh, but we're going to do everything on our side in order to make it uh, as uh, safe as possible. Uh, we, uh, I'm always surprised that people don't seem to have a problem to go to Walmart or they don't have a problem going uh, different places, being a part around crowds and such as that, but when it comes to church, they say, oh, no, I can't do that. That's always surprising to me. But that's between you and the Lord. So I hope that uh, uh, we just got to learn to get our church back going again. So I hope that you'll be a part of it. All righty. This morning's message, if you'll go with me to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to be, begin reading with verse number 1. Uh, as I read, I want you to note uh, one thing, uh, and that's the word know or knowledge. Uh, as I read through here, I'll, I'll point it out here in just a second, okay? The Bible says, verse number one, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied uh, unto you through the knowledge of God. In other words, uh, you understand the grace and you understand the peace of God through the knowledge of God, your understanding of the Word of God. That's called spiritual maturity. Okay? Uh, so, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and, our, and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according to as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to his glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through, the, through lust. Verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But, that's a conjunction could also be said for. For he that lacketh these things. What things? These virtues. For he that lacketh these things is blind. And cannot see afar off. 
and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, and we thank you for the privilege that you give us to be able to stand here and preach and teach the Word of God. We do our best to try to equip people to do the work of the ministry, to be able to grow, to be able to become more like Christ. I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful for our church being able to make this to where we can do this, that we impact a lot of folk that might be watching this or listening to it. I'm grateful for those that are willing to come and uh, be able to make this take place. I, I just have the joy of being able to stand here and preach, but they make it happen. So, Father, I pray that we'll do our best now today to honor you. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Actually, I, I thought that last week's message was uh, my last message as far as dealing with spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. That was my plans anyhow. But that was until, as, uh, as I was reading my Bible this week, I just happened to come across 2 Peter chapter number 1. And I thought to myself that if there was anybody who knew the importance to spiritual maturity, it would certainly be the Apostle Peter and all that he went through. Especially in the early years of his Christian life, in the early years of his ministry, and some of the choices and the decisions that, that he made. Peter wrote this particular epistle somewhere around 67, 68 A.D. And, uh, of course, Christ had been ascended back to heaven for 30 or 35 years, and Peter had been in the ministry all this time, and he had grown, he had matured. God had been working in his heart and life. Uh, when Peter wrote the book of uh, 2 Peter, he was in prison in Rome. Peter knew that his life was getting ready to come to an end. Matter of fact, if you look uh, in chapter 1, verse 14, he says this, Knowing that shortly I must, be put off, I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus had showed me. In other words, Christ had already told him that, uh, that he was going to die. So by now, Peter knew the importance in his life of spiritual maturity. He knew how vital it was for people to have a knowledge of God, to have a knowledge of the Word of God and the things of God, what God had to say. Now, if anybody, I believe, in the, in the early church knew the importance of being alert and, and mature spiritually, it was probably Peter. Uh, he had a tendency in his early years to feel somewhat overconfident when, when danger was near and, and to overlook at some of the warnings that Christ would give them. If you remember in, in his life, he would, he would rush ahead when he should have waited. Peter was bad to, to do things like that. He'd sleep when he should have been praying. He talked when he should have been listening uh, he was fearless, but sometimes Peter was very foolish. I think that's maybe one of the reasons that so many of us relate with Peter in his life. He had, Peter, what I called, he had hoof and mouth disease. He's always putting his foot in his mouth, and, and uh, many of us are uh, much like that. But here is Peter's point. He, he learned his lesson, and what he wanted to do was to help you and I today to learn the lessons that he had learned. Maybe we don't have to learn them the hard way as he did. Uh, in Peter's first epistle, Peter emphasized the grace of God. Uh, that's found all the way through uh, 1 Peter. As a matter of fact, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12, listen to what he says. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. But when he comes to 2 Peter, his emphasis is on the knowledge of God, not so much the grace of God, but the knowledge of God to really know God. And the word know or knowledge is used at least 13 different times in this short epistle. Now, what Peter wants you to understand is in order for a believer 
to demonstrate God's ultimate uh, goal in, his, in, in every believer's life, which is, which is Christ-likeness. Uh, these particular virtues that he's going to talk about needs to be in the life of every believer. They need to be able to be manifested and demonstrated by the lives that they live. And I'll, um, I'll explain what uh, uh, and define what Peter was talking about by virtues here in just a minute. But if you'll follow along with me on this this morning, I believe that it'll be a help to you. But let me show you number one. Okay, First of all, there's the believer's responsibility. Look what he says in verse number five. Chapter 1, verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. If you'll notice that little phrase, and beside all this, in other words, that simply means this, for this very reason. And by Peter using the word, if you'll notice, and also in verse number 5, the word giving. And beside this, or in lieu of all this, he says giving all diligence. The word giving there, it, it brings it to light the question, what are believers to be giving? What is, what is our responsibility as far as spiritual maturity is concerned? I think it's vital that you and I both understand that spiritual maturity is our responsibility. It's not God's responsibility. God will put things in place so that we can grow, so that we can mature. God will design things to come into our lives. We know that all things work together for the good. God will design these things in our lives so that we can grow, but it's left up to you and I to grow. It's left up to us to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. So he uses that word giving, and then he, he talks about giving what? All diligence. Peter is simply saying that all believers are to be making every effort to grow in the likeness of Christ. That's our responsibility. Now, what is it that he says there that we're to add? Look again at verse number five. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Well, what are we to add? What Peter is saying is, which is given in the form of a command, that word add is a command. It's not a suggestion. Not something if it's good for you. He said, no. He said, I want you to add these things to your life. The word virtue there is it's a word which means moral excellence. In other words, moral excellence in the life of a believer, that's to be made known by the production of these particular characteristics in our life. He says, these moral excellence that we're getting ready to look at, he says, need to be implemented in your life so that you can make Christ known by the life that you live. And as you and I demonstrate these characteristics in our life, we demonstrate our spiritual maturity. We demonstrate that, we, that we're growing. And if we fail to demonstrate these virtues in our life, then we're demonstrating the fact that I'm not growing spiritually. I'm, I'm not making much headway. Okay, So when a person, when a person places their faith in Christ... As Savior, the Bible says God makes them a new creature, new creation. And from the, from the moment of salvation, that person is to strive to reflect his or her new position in Christ in, in their practice, in, the, in their daily living, how they live out their life, how they walk the walk. But even though he lives in a, and all of us do live in a culture which includes great deal of immorality, and uh, no character, truly, no character at all, a believer's life is to char be characterized by the virtue or these moral excellencies that we're going to look at in our life. We're to demonstrate these characteristics in our life. So, uh, there was another great writer, his name was Paul. Paul talked about the same thing. The Apostle Paul spoke of the importance of virtue in, uh, in, in praise in the life of believers. This is what he says in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number four, verse number eight. This is Paul writing. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, 
whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any moral excellence, if there be any praise, think on these things. There's another verse that goes along with that. He talks about the, uh, uh, the, the characteristics that we're to demonstrate. This is Paul wrote to the Galatians. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Point being is you and I are to manifest these attitudes and these characteristics by the lives that we live. Now, virtue or moral excellence should be the, the goal of every believer, but it won't become a reality in our lives and it won't become, uh, I don't know how to say that, it won't become in such a reality that they're true in everything that we do until we're like Jesus, until the rapture of the church. But Christ gives us a goal to shoot for. He's not going to give us a goal that's, that's not uh, perfect. He said, I want you to shoot for moral excellence. I want you to shoot for this virtues in your life. Now, to make virtue or moral excellence a reality in our lives as, as believers, I think it's necessary for a believer to starve his old sin nature while feeding the new spiritual nature on the Word of God. In other words, allowing the Spirit of God to produce these qualities or these virtues in our lives. You can't have both. You can't feed the flesh. You can't satisfy the flesh. You can't do all these things and expect to grow in your spiritual life. It just, that's not how it works. So you'll notice that each of these flow from one to the other. That's how he kind of designed this thing. This is, not a, this is not a smorgasbord, so to speak, that you can pick and choose what you like and forget the others. As he lists these uh, uh, six or seven uh, characteristics that ought to be true in our lives, you say, well, I like that one, but this one's not too slick. Or these will work good, but no, that doesn't work too well either. No, he says, you, you are your design to make all of these known and they build one on another. So let's, let's consider them real quick. I won't spend a lot of time on them. You could preach a message on each one of them individually. First of all, virtue and knowledge flow from faith. Look what he says in our text once again, verse number five. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. Now, but when he talks about faith, faith is what links you and I to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other means of salvation. There is no other means of a proper relationship with God other than our faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other. There is no plan B. God said we're saved by grace through faith. Let me give you another verse. It's found in the book of 1 Corinthians um, Romans, I'm sorry, in Romans, Acts Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm at peace with God simply because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way that God the Father will accept me, a sinner, is by my faith in Jesus Christ, His Son. That's what God did for us. There's another verse found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given un, uh, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The Bible clearly states that a man is saved by his faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not saved by the fact that I am a Baptist. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher. I'm not saved because I got baptized. I'm not saved because my name's on a church roll. I'm saved because I saw myself as a sinner in need of a Savior, realizing Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the price for my sin. I repented of my sin. I turned from my sin, turned to Jesus Christ, and put my faith and trust in Him. That's salvation. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You just receive it like a gift. Our faith in Christ makes us 
the Bible says a new life is possible, a new creation. Listen again what the Bible says. He talks about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be what? In Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I became a new creation in Christ Jesus the moment that I placed my faith and trust in Christ. That talks about my position in Christ, not my practice, my position. The point being is the moment that I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ, God the Father looked down at me. I was placed in Jesus Christ. God doesn't see me God sees Christ. I'm in Christ because I'm in Christ. I'm accepted by God the Father. But I've also got to practice living. In other words, I've got to live a life out on this, this earth. Now, I'm going to mess up along the way. I know some of y'all don't, and I just wish y'all be a part of our church. But uh, we've got a church full of sinners saved by grace. And we've got a church full of people that on a regular basis need to confess their sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He, meaning God, is faithful, meaning He'll do it every time, faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's talking about after salvation. We get, we get dirty walking through this thing called life in this world. So, uh, my position in Christ changed the moment that I put my faith in Trust in Christ. But my practice is a work, and I'm, I'm, I'm still working on it. So he says, number one, add virtue. As I, as I go through this thing called life, as I walk through this thing called life, <clears throat> God's called me to make a difference in the lives of other people. That's what spiritual maturity is all about. So if I'm going to make a difference in somebody's life, if you're going to make a difference in someone's life, if you're going to make a difference in the life of your child, if you're going to make a difference in the life of your grandchild, if you're going to make a difference in the life of your friend, and the list could go on, if you're going to make a difference in the lives of other people, you've got to incorporate these things in your life. He said, that's how we make a difference. First thing he talks about there, he says, add Virtue. The word add there is a, is a word which is a understood to go in front of each of these characteristics, okay? Each of these virtues. Add virtue. And the simplest way to define virtue is to ask this simple question What would Jesus do? You find yourself in some sort of a circumstance, in a situation, whatever it may be, you find yourself being tempted. You find yourself being going through a trial, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? That's called virtue, called moral excellence, called being like Christ is what he's trying to say. The believer who has a heart and a desire to grow and mature spiritually longs to be like Jesus. But let me insert something here for just a second. You need to understand if you've got no heart to be like Jesus Christ. You've got no heart to care about other people. If you've got no heart to be in the house of God and hear the word of God so that you can incorporate these things in your life, you've got no heart to try to reach other people. You've got no heart. You say, I love my children. Well, try to keep your children out of hell. I love my children. Well, try to get your children to grow up and be like Jesus. We've got, a, we've got a generation of people that are more concerned about their children being more like some ball player and playing ball with some school than they are being like Jesus. Sad, absolutely bona fide sad that people look at life like that when that stuff just not gonna last. So what would Jesus do? Second thing, add knowledge. From this virtue flows a desire to know more about Christ, to know the Word of God. We find ourselves eager and hungry to search the Scriptures as we desire to grow. Listen again what the Bible says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman 
Need it not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what the word workman there has the idea of? The workman there has the idea of somebody that you're trying to make a difference in their lives. If you're a husband, you're trying to help make a difference in the life of your wife. If you're a wife, you're trying to make a difference in the life of your husband or your children or your grandchildren or whatever it may be. But we are to be workmen. Let me tell you something, guys. It takes a lot of hard work to be spiritually mature. Anybody can be like the world. Any two before can be like the world. But it takes somebody to choose, and it is a choice, to try to strive to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Third thing, real quick. Self-control and patience flow from knowledge. Look again what our text says. Look at what he says in verse number six. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. The word temperance there means to remain, remain, remain under control in times of trials and testing in a way that honors the Lord. All of us go through our times of temptation. It doesn't matter who we are. All of us go through our times of trials in life. We have, we have trials, physical trials, financial trials, marital trials. We have temptations that we deal with on a regular basis. We have the TV that comes into our life. We have the, the computer. Even on the phone nowadays, people are tempted to, to look at things they ought not to look at. He says, add temperance. The word was often used of the, the virtue of, of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual or sexual passions and trying to keep them under control. So many lives and marriages nowadays are destroyed because of people giving in to those things. Then he says, add patience. The knowledge of God and and his word makes us patient with people, makes us to be long-suffering with people. You know, we we won't allow, when he's talking about this, he says, you're not going to allow little things to get you down because we know that Christ is in control of whatever it is that we might be going through in life. Some of y'all might be right now because of this pandemic or it may be because of some sort of situation going on at work or whatever whatever it may be. Some of us sometimes face these circumstances in our lives where where we need God to give us all the grace and the patience that we can possibly get. But God's under control in all that we go through. God's got a design and a plan in your life and my life to get us through these things. Then he says, add godliness. And this is really good. Patience and perseverance is difficult. In difficult times, it makes us godly people. Always remember the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the difficulties that Jesus faced. Think of what Christ, there's there's not anything that you and I go through in life that Jesus didn't face. Doesn't matter what it may be. And he faced a lot more than you did and I do in the things that he's gone through in his life. Think of all the, the scourging, the crown of thorns, and the cross, and the list could go on and on. Then he goes on and he talks about add kindness. The kindness of Christ makes us the the kind of to other people and forgiving towards other people. Good natured towards other people. God wants us to be kind towards people. Let me give you a a great verse to consider. It's found in the book of uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 32. Be a kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If you want to demonstrate Christ's likeness, learn to forgive people. You've been forgiven. God knows I've been forgiven. And I thank God for that. I think one of the greatest things found in Scripture is forgiveness. Not only in the forgiveness of sin, that the fact that we owed sin... But I'm talking about after we get saved, how God's willing to forgive us and how other people are willing to forgive us. And then lastly, he says there, add charity. 
That word charity there is the strongest word you find in Scripture. It talks about agape. It talks about John 3, 16, love. Charity means love. For God so loved the world that, that he gave. How are people going to know that, that we have a personal relationship with a living Savior by our love for one another and by our manifestation of these particular virtues and Christ-like characters in our lives, which is called spiritual maturity. Listen, guys, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible for fallen human nature to manufacture these qualities of Christian character. They cannot do it. It's impossible. They must be produced by the Spirit of God. But let me say this, just in defense of something, okay? Listen carefully. I have no doubt that there are unsaved people who, uh, who uh, possess amazing self-control when, when they're tempted. They, they are able to get through trials and times and, and, and deal with endurance and such as that and patience. But these virtues that they have point people to them and not to Christ. When you and I manifest these characteristics, when you and I manifest these virtues, they point to Jesus Christ and what Christ has done in our hearts and our lives. Now, let me give you the last point. Expected results of a spiritually mature believer and I hope that you'll get this and listen carefully. Look what he says, verses 8 and 9. These are the expected results. If we incorporate these virtues, this is what's expected. Verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Of course, in verse number uh, eight there, the word these things refers to the virtues of what we saw in verses five, six, and seven. But I want you to notice, if you would, in verse number eight, he talks about and abound. Peter is basically saying two things. A spiritually mature believer is a spirit-filled believer, okay? Uh, I was trying to consider a way to illustrate this, uh, the word abound, and it works like this. You and I are to abound with these virtues in our life, and I thought of it this way. Let's take, for instance, if you have a five-gallon bucket and you're trying to fill that bucket up with water, okay? Now, that, uh, that bucket, uh, the water coming up in that bucket is my life and your life, okay? How we live our lives. And we're, we, our lives are to live, be lived spirit-filled. We're to, we're to fill our life all the way up to the top, okay? But the word abound there means th those things that overflow, in other words, your life and my life is not going to impact the lives of others with these virtues until they overflow in our lives. Once they overflow in my life, they impact the lives of others. That's what he talks about when he's talking about to abound. Then he goes on to say, and they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. Actually, that's a negative way of saying that if you have them, if you have these virtues, you'll be productive and you'll be fruitful if these things are true in your life. And truth is, God's called you and God's called me in our lives to be fruitful. That's what our, actually our lives are all about is to bear fruit. God wants my life and your life to bear fruit. But I want you to notice something there. Notice what he says, the word barren. The word barren there in that, in that uh, verse 8 means idle. It means to be uh, inactive or, or useless. Uh, a way to illustrate that is like this. Let's say, for instance, that you go out and you get in your car. And uh, you sit down in your car and you put your key in your ignition. You crank your car up and you sit there and rev it and rev it and rev it. 
and, uh, but you're not making any progress. You're not going anywhere. All you're doing is just sitting there revving your engine. Now, watch this carefully. When he uses the word barren, he means idle, which simply means that you've, just, you've made a choice of never putting that car in gear to make an advancement. You never choose to, to get going for it. That's the same way a lot of people are when it comes to as far as their spiritual maturity. They've never made a choice to become spiritually mature in their lives so that they in turn can make a difference in the lives of other people. They said, my life is about me. My life is what I want to do. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to live my life just like I want to. I don't care if I'm fruitful or not, as long as me and mine and my four are happy, that's all that matters. In other words, they're not, they're not concerned with, with being barren. They're not concerned with their life not producing fruit. They don't concern themselves with abounding. Verse nine, I'll wrap this thing up. But he, or for he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. When a person lacks these things, these virtues that we've already looked like, the Bible says he's blind. Now, I believe this can mean one of two things. <clears throat> Listen carefully. Satan has blinded him to his need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen again what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter number 4 and verse number 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I'm as convinced as I can be that in churches like New Testament Baptist Church, Maybe your church, a lot of churches, doesn't have to be a Baptist church, it's, it's immaterial. A lot of people are convinced that because they're in church, because their name's on a church row, because they're Baptist or their granny was Baptist or they've been a deacon or whatever the list may be, they've been in a baptistry and they, you know, and the list could go on. They say, I'm, I'm all right. And Satan has blinded them about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if they slow down long enough, they can't see the fact that they produce no fruit. There's been no change in their lives since that day they thought they got saved. You say, do you really believe that's true? I know it's true. I was one of them. I know it's true. My wife was one of them. I wish I had time to share her testimony with you. My wife had, years ago, they used to give out little bars when you would be perfect attendance in Sunday school. You got to, if you, they're all, every 51 Sundays, she had 13 bars, 13 straight years of perfect attendance in Sunday school when she was growing up. If there's anybody exposed to the gospel, she was. My wife didn't get saved until my first year of Bible college because it was then that she realized that she had been blinded by Satan, had never accepted Christ as Savior. She was religious. She was lost. And I'm as convinced as I can be that we have people in our churches exact same way. There's another verse found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse 14. Listen to what he says. I think it's important that you, 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 you get this. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man, the unsaved man, the things that you and I do in our lives, to them what we do is foolishness. What we're doing today is foolishness to them. And you know what's so sad? There are people in our churches that think that what we're trying to do here, even during this pandemic of trying to meet again and get church going again, is foolishness to them. You're foolish. You ought to stay home and 
go in a cave, stay in a basement. Foolishness to them. Sad. But nonetheless, let me, uh, let me wrap it up with this. Here's my last point. And I think why many people choose not to grow spiritually. They choose not to produce any fruit, spiritual fruit with their lives. They choose to have no problem sitting idly by while others need to see Christ in their life. Doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother them that that their child is going to grow up and not have one blessed clue to know how to live a fruitful Christian life. Oh, they'll know how to hit a ball. They'll know how to make a jump shot. They'll know how to, how to flip and flop and all that. They'll know all that. They'll, like a lot of guys, they'll know how to, how to kill a deer. They'll know how to catch a fish. They'll know all those things. They'll invest their lives, years of their lives for that and not produce any fruit whatsoever for the Lord and expect to stand before God someday and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Ain't gonna happen. Let me show you one verse and I'm through. John chapter number 15. John 15. I want you to look with me for just a second. Verse one, Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch and the branch is, is supposedly be the believers that's in the vine, okay? Picture that, okay? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You say, well, why would he do that? Because they don't belong there, because they're not saved. If it bears no fruit, when the time comes to stand before God in judgment, you bore no fruit, you had no relationship with Jesus Christ whatsoever. Because he goes on to say in in verse number two, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. If you study chapter 15 of John, it talks about fruit, more fruit, much fruit. It's all about fruit about what we produce with our lives. And if the Spirit of God doesn't at time purge you, you know, purging is a good thing in the life of a believer. It's just like a parent at times needs to correct their child so that their child will know how to live their life. So that the child, when they grow up, will live a productive life. If you choose not to Correct your child. I've known of parents. We've had parents come through our church. We don't believe in discipline. Though the Bible teaches it. No, we, we, don't, we don't believe in discipline. And their child now is a mess. Children's a mess. God purges us for a purpose. And that purpose is that we might bear fruit. We're going to bear fruit as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But it all boils down to this. It's all a choice that you make. You either choose to bear fruit or you choose not to. The choice is yours. My encouragement to you is, first of all, is to know that you know Christ is Savior. Know that you're saved. Know without a doubt. There ought not to be a question mark there. You don't have to remember the day and the date and the time and, and all that. You just need to know that there was a day in your life when you saw yourself as a sinner and you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of that sin and come in your heart and life and be your Savior. Our Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you, Lord, for this little series that we've been doing, how important it is in our lives to be spiritual and mature because it's our life that's going to impact the lives of others. And God, how I pray that we'll understand the importance of that. And if there happens to be a person watching this today or listening that does not know Christ as Savior or there's the slightest doubt, and if they would mean it with all of their heart, they could say something like this, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm asking you today to forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and my life. Be my Savior. I'm trusting you and you only to save me. For Christians this morning or believers who's not producing any fruit, have no desire to produce fruit. 
God, how I pray you touch their hearts. Help them to see the importance of making an investment with the life that you've given them to live and not to waste it on things that have absolutely no eternal value. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.